Okay. So welcome to Philosophy in the Spotlight. Um, Elizabeth and I are absolutely honored to have um, a, one of a brilliant scholar join us today, um, Daniel Tuck, um, who will be discussing a text um, by Leszek Kowalkowski, Kowalkowski, sorry. Uh, and Daniel is the founder of the study groups on psychoanalysis and politics, which is a public learning platform that offers study groups, seminars, and podcasts. Daniel Tutts, also this, uh, the author of Psychoanalysis and the Politics of the Family, The Crisis of Initiation. And currently, he's writing a book on the perspectivism or praxis of, new Mar of the new Marxist critique of Nietzsche for repeater books. Um, he also hosts a podcast for the left with a focus on Marxist theory, psychoanalysis, and philosophy um, at Jouissance, Vampires, and Zero Books. So you can all check out all of that wonderful stuff. He's also taught at George Washington University and Marymount University and at a DC jail, which is fantastic. Um, so we are so honored to have you here, Daniel. Thank you so much um, for joining us today in Philosophy in the Spotlight. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here on a Saturday night. Thanks, Chris and Elizabeth, for hosting me. Um, so, yeah, so Leszek Kowalkowski, Ko, uh, Ko, sorry, the, the W it actually is to be pronounced with a V. A v. Uh, he's a very fascinating figure. I think everyone um, should read his work. Um, he was a Polish Marxist humanist in the 20th century and um, wrote numer numerous works on history of Marxist thought. <clears throat> um, he has a, an incredible collection of essays published in the revolutionary year of 1968 um, on, on different um, analyses of Marxist humanism. He saw Marx as a thinker, basically like a Renaissance humanist in the sense that he sees Marx as a philosopher, uh, true and true, but to the end, meaning that Marx for him is to be understood as someone who's concerned with the entirety of human knowledge. Uh, Marx is someone who's interested in, you know, emancipation of humanity and is without question a humanist in that sense. The other noteworthy thing of Kowalkowski's reading of Marx is that he does not posit an epistemological break from the early to the so-called mature Marx of capital. He, th he thinks that the um, um, origin of Marx right after his dissertation, right once Marx became a journalist, establishes uh, the thrust of revolutionary socialism and the development of communism under, um, under basically humanist principles. So uh, he really puts a lot, a big onus on the 1844 manuscripts that Marx wrote in Paris. And he argues that those theories of alienation form the bedrock of his theory of the proletariat and of his theory of uh, the revolution of capitalism. So in that sense, he's um, not really concerned about capital <laughs> in, in a certain way, which is kind of interesting because a lot of Marxists today, um, in part because much of Marx's work has not been published until recently. In fact, even the 1844 manuscripts, I think, were not published until like in the 1920s, 1923, if I'm not mistaken, right? So um, much of Marx's work, which we see as canonical today, was actually subsequently published sometimes multiple decades after. And in fact, that's actually a great irony of the workers' movement, which is the height of what Kowalkowski calls the golden age of the workers' movement, all of the core texts of that we know Marxism of today were actually missing in many ways. And in fact, um, during that time, a work like Anti During, which was really more of a manifesto of Marxist thought, kind of systematic philosophical presentation to the working class of what Marxism is, was going to be much more widely read than Marx's mature work. So, um, Main Currents of Marxism as a book, I think, uh, warrants a couple comments. It is important, I think, to read. It was um, 
seen by a philosopher such as Richard Rorty, the American pragmatist, as a book which effectively ended Marxism in the academy because of the third part of the book where he tries to systematically deconstruct and refute contemporary Marxists, uh, which is a whole conversation we can have. He, do, he offers a lot of really uncharitable readings, I think, of, of contemporary Marxists, which I'm definitely not convinced of, like half of those. Um, although he's most well known for his strident critiques of Stalinism, because he was involved with welcoming the USSR into Poland, his home country. But then as the pogroms occurred, and as he saw the kind of, um, he became cynically disillusioned with Stalinism. And this also led to Kowakowski's vision that I think is also to be questioned and definitely refuted, which is that Stalinism represents the kind of natural teleological endpoint of Marxism, right? Which is something we can discuss. But what I really wanted to talk about, Chris and Elizabeth, is the first part of the book, because one of the big questions in Marxist scholarship, if you take on especially what Ernst Bloch calls the warm stream of Marxism or a kind of Marxist humanism is precisely how do you historically understand the origin of Marxism as a social and political phenomenon? Like, where does it come from? Do we understand Marxism simply as a radicalization of the Jacobins and the French Revolution? Or in fact, is there something prior to that which helps us understand? Like, what's the prehistory of Marxism? And so there's been a lot of thinkers that have written about this, like Ernst Bloch himself has an incredible book um, called Avicenna and the Aristotelian Left, where he says that the Muslim philosopher Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, um, developed a theory of matter, which would basically pose a um, diametrical opposition to the more conservative uh, vision of the church fathers. And which would actually become a kind of source of within Europe, by the way, because there was actual heretics who were following like the uh, teachings of Ibn Sina, who were actually Christians, right? So that's one like kind of genealogical line. Of course, another famous line would be to understand um, the Joachim of Fiore, of a great theologian who was around the time of St. Francis of Assisi in the 1200s, 1100s who develops what would become the kind of tripartite imminent theory of history, which is the birth of Hegelian thought, right? Uh, if you read, for example, a work called Occidental Eschatology by Jakob Tobes, you'll see a wonderful elaboration of that genealogy. But what Kovakovsky offers us is an origin in um, Plotinus, the Neoplatonist philosopher of the 400s. And I wanted to briefly summarize why I think that is interesting, because basically what he says is that Marxism, and of course, we understand Marxism usually as turning Hegel on its head or making Hegel more materialist, right, or radicalizing Hegelianism, right? Um, we know that Marx, as a young student, was basically swimming in the circles of the young Hegelians or the radical Hegelians, um, but what I think is so beautiful about main currents, at least the first section, is that he breaks down this genealogy in only 50 pages, which I think, Chris and Elizabeth, you got a chance to read, so I'm excited to chat with you guys about it, about how actually Plotinus is the true heir of Hegel and Marx in the sense that Plotinus put forward the notion that man's existential predicament caught within the matrices of earthly time can be overcome through man's realization of the one or of the absolute, right? That there is actually like an existential reconciliation that is possible, that is um, imminent to, to man, right? Like this is a kind of wager that Plotinus would put down and which a hundred years later saying, I'm sorry about that, everyone. Um, Twitter Spaces is having a problem, and it crashed. So I'm going to invite Daniel back as a co-host and apologize sincerely to him. No worries. I can kind of pick up where I was at. Um, welcome. Yeah, to, that would be great. Yeah, welcome to folks that missed um, my kind of little exposition. What I'm, what I'm trying to do here is summarize um, the first part of The Main Currents of Marxism by Leszek Kołakowski, the Polish Marxist humanist, 
who turned liberal in about the 1970s and who was a, a very colorful and very important figure in uh, Western humanities uh, in the 20th century, died in, I think, 2009. Um, the book Main Currents of Marxism is a book which is not talked about much, but which used to be um, seen as sort of a um, refutation of 20th century Stalinism. And um, it's broken down into three parts. Um, the first one is called The Founders, which is an analysis of Marx and Engels' thought. Uh, the second section is called The Golden Age, which is an analysis of the workers' movement, which is basically Marxists, right, from about 1848 up to um, World War One period. And then the third part is uh, what he calls The Breakdown, which is basically... Um, state socialism 20th century onward and um he analyzes and has a section on every significant marxist uh of all time um and so the book proposes to be a systematic commentary and according to some maybe we could say more conservative or liberal commentators it proposes to be a kind of final statement on the end of marxism in some sense which is why Richard Rorty said that the book actually did end Marxism, um, especially in the Western Academy. Um, so it's something which, again, is not talked about too much, but which I think as speaking now as myself, someone who's very committed to the Marxist tradition, I think we should not be shy to read texts which challenge us in this way and which, so because we become more fluent with our own commitments, right? We become more confident um, as Marxists. If anyone on this call, I think some of you, based on uh, the fact that I, I've known you for a few years on Twitter, definitely are committed to, to Marxism. But as I was saying, he opens the text in a beautiful way, which is he's a historian of ideas as well as a philosopher. So he's asking the question, where does Marxism actually emerge? And it emerges in Western thought in Neoplatonism, the Neoplatonism of Plotinus, and um, Plotinus is basically, in his nine works, the Enids, he develops a kind of spiritual uh, methodology for the human being to escape the kind of finitude of what Kowalkowski refers to frequently as contingency. So contingency is something from Neoplatonism all the way up to Hegel, that philosophy offers a resolution to which is which is what which is a subsumption into the absolute which would solve the, the predicament the suffering the degradation of everyday temporal existence right and he says of course the neoplatonists before saint augustine got a hold of them had no commitment to supernaturalism and in fact you could actually he, he shows that um what Hegel was trying to sort of re-initiate uh, in some sense was a return to the very uh, question that the Enlightenment with Hume and Kant and, and Rousseau basically put off the table, which was how does man come into relation to the absolute, right? And of course, for Marx, in a way, Marx, um, according to Kovokovsky, but also according to Georg Lukács, because keep in mind, Kovokovsky is a fascinating figure, like many 20th century figures. What I love about his biography is that for a time he was very much a Marxist. And when he was a Marxist, he was very simpatico with Lukács. And so Lukács and him are what I would call kind of philosophical Marxists, right? They see Marx's project as centered on philosophy. Right. Like um, in Marx's text on the Jewish question, he says basically philosophy is the solution to the proletariat. It is um, the head. Right. And, and the proletariat is the heart of revolution. Philosophy itself. So in a way, even though and I want to I want to kind of elaborate the relationship between Hegel and Marx in a moment and invite maybe Chris, who does a lot of work on German idealism to jump in there, too. Even though uh, he's trying to move away from Hegel's kind of ultra-state-centered form of politics and is trying to turn Hegel into a more materialist, 
Kobukowski tries to, I think, argue that Marx, in a way, tries to achieve uh, something close to this Neoplatonist resolution of humanity. Because again, if Marx is a humanist, and Kobukowski says in the first few pages of the book that Marx should be read as a Renaissance humanist, meaning that Marx is trying to present a comprehensive solution to humanity, right? Um, then I think we can actually benefit from his prehistory here. So he takes it from um, Neoplatonism to St. Augustine. And there's another very important point that another fellow traveler of um, Kovakoski, who is a close, I think they were kind of frenemies, is a, a scholar who's a, a, based in France named Lucien Goldman. And Lucien Goldman also developed another kind of historical genealogical theory of the origin of Marxism as emanating out of um, Pascal, especially the orientation that Pascal was associated with in the Catholic Church called Jansenism. And Jansen had a dispute with uh, the church with a figure called Pelagius. And that dispute opens up what Lucien Goldman considers to be uh, a dispute that Marx opens up with bourgeois liberal society in his own time, right? Because what it had to do with is the status of original sin. And Pelagius is basically a figure who's in short, just to summarize, rejecting this kind of imposition of original sin. And he's on the side of a kind of radical emancipatory libertinism, just in the same way that Marx is. And Goldman says that the uh, bourgeoisie adopted a Jansenist orientation to sin, and that also involved, importantly, a limitation on what revolution of humanity is possible, right? So part of what Goldman and Kobokowski were interested in is what exactly are the historical preconditions that explain in the post-French revolutionary period the emergence of a radical philosophy such as Marxism, right? Another great example of this, of course, is um, a work by Ernst Bloch on Munzer, because we always talk about Martin Luther at the head of Protestant Reformation, but we never talk about Thomas Munzer, who was basically the kind of more Marxist-oriented uh, version <laughs> of Protestant Reformation, right? The Anabaptist movement, he basically led a uh, radical peasant revolt which was suppressed, but which was in form basically an anti-property radical communistic movement against, against effectively against the state, right? And so a lot of Marxist historians, what interests me and philosophers are asking themselves, what actually is the prehistory? And I think Kobokowski's opening is really, really useful to read. So we move from Plotinus to another figure, another important um, figure in Neoplatonism, um, John Scotus Regina, who wrote the Paraphysian. And the Paraphysian is basically, according to Kobokovsky, a text which is involved, it, it's, it's a text revolving around this kind of Neoplatonist obsession with subsumption of the one and man's relationship to nature. But it introduces a, a, what he calls a prototype of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit in the middle in the Middle Ages, and um, what he says most importantly is that Erigena's John Scotus's intervention constitutes in the history of European thought the first time that liberation of humanity is thought of uh, through the use of a term he calls anthropos, right? So that it's like a for for the first time a fully human centered conception of revolution. So you can see already that you're going from Plato to the Neoplatonists through Augustine, and you're developing a more imminent theory of the liberation of humanity, right? He then extends this to Meister Eckhart, and then into the Enlightenment. And he says that Rousseau, Hume, and Kant, 
all reached a basically a fundamental deadlock as it pertains to this question that Plato opens about man's relationship to the absolute. And for various reasons, they foreclose it, right? He says there's nothing dialectical in Rousseau. Humanity is basically in a decrepit position for which they cannot transcend. And he says much very interesting things regarding Kant and Kant's various dualisms, which ultimately result in the inaccessibility. This kind of noumenal realm of the thing in itself is foreclosed to man's perception. Man kind of can see the sort of field of the structure of it, but is barred from like a subsumption into its logic or into its structure, basically, for Kant. And this dualism, um, however, Kant still presents an interesting way out through what Kowalkowski calls deification, right? The deification of humanity um, and that there is an early kind of solution to this predicament, which he then turns to Fichte. And since Chris does so much work on Fichte, I'd love to see what you thought about what Kowalkowski says about Fichte. But he says... uh, Fichte was an extremely ambitious figure in philosophy who basically wanted to say that Kant's theory of the noumenal, of the thing in itself, is what he calls pure dogmatism. And that in reality, um, humanity, so Fichte brings back a much more robust and much more radical theory for the liberation of humanity. But the problem with it, Kowalkowski says, is that what you find in Fichte's theory of revolution humanity what he calls universal humanity is basically a realm of social freedom in which everyone is basically the same and difference is basically erased and he says that this way more than hegel could be seen as a kind of precursor to what would become the various totalitarianisms of the 20th century (laughs) which i found very interesting um and then he works his way up to hegel and of course um Hegel brings the Neoplatonist wager back into his thinking in the sense that the task of philosophy is one of liberation of man's contingency um, through a kind of um, sublation of the particular and the general. So it's um, the most sophisticated, because again, the title of the section that I'm trying to summarize is called Origin of Dialectic. And it goes from Plato, Neoplatonism, all the way up to Hegel, and I think in a brilliant way, and I'm just going to stop here and invite maybe Chris to say something, I feel I want to, and, and Elizabeth as well, but he says that the problem with Hegel is basically that Hegel reduces um, the relationship of man to the absolute to a question of the intellect. So it becomes both overly idealist and it becomes reliant on the theory of the state, which in practical terms, and by practical terms, I mean like how the Hegelian philosophy was actually instituted and practiced in European um, culture, ended up actually achieving all of these various dead ends for which the young Hegelians and the left Hegelians would come to reconcile. And the main problem that revolved there was basically uh hegel's theory of history because history and reason were you know introduced as certain logics for emancipation became ultimately too conservative because they became the mantra of the prussian state right so they became kind of um you had to put forward because he says importantly hegel barred any future oriented thinking of the dialectic. And he says it was not until Moses Hess that you have the introduction of a futuristic mode of Hegelianism, right? So I think Kowalkowski does a nice job of showing Bruno Bauer, Moses Hess, and a whole other range of young Hegelians who I was actually less familiar with, and how they each invented certain ways that would come to influence Marx in Marx's eventual break with the Hegelianism, and of course, Marx's break with Hegelianism was a break with Feuerbach, first and foremost, who was the kind of chief expositor of the Hegelian philosophy. But anyways, I've said quite a lot. I've taken us from basically 
Platonism all the way up to Hegel in a very summary fashion. I'm just going to pause and see what Chris thinks. Because, Chris, you did get a chance to read this, yeah? Oh, I did. I did. I, I read the book, yes. I read the text so, or, or the allotted pages that we had. Um, I just had a, a quick question for you. Um, and I know you've already gone over this, but I'm, I'm interested, actually. Um, and I'm interested in his... Um, Chronolo chronological reading of all these texts. Yes. Um, he, he states in the introduction that when it comes to Marxist texts and it comes to Marxists, that they usually fall into three camps, Philosoph philosophical anthropologists, you know, there's a, a philosophical anthropology, a reading, um, socialist doctrines, and then economic. Do right. you think that um, Kolakowski is is creating a, or, or he's he's giving us a kind of genealogy or a, a philosophical anthropology through this text or is he doing more because i know he sees marx as a as a renaissance thinker and mm -hmm. as a philosopher and he says you know marxism before marx has no meaning unless uh, you know it even it could not just be emptied it, it has this entire rich european cultural history so i was just wondering is he is he trying to grasp a kind of genealogy here that that links itself up to the the main um, ideas of dialectic and secondly what what i was shocked to see is that i he doesn't have any of the aristotelian tradition like he doesn't yeah, have that's right um he doesn't have um thomas aquinas who is like the systematizer of um, the medieval era he doesn't have occam he doesn't have scotus um he right. has he has a lot of what 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 I see as the pantheist tradition and the Teutonic tradition in Germany. So we have, you know, Aragina is of course Irish, but he has this rich, you know, he has Angelus Silesius, he has Jakob Böhme, he has uh, Meister Eckhart, and of course all of these thinkers inspired both um, Schelling and Hegel. Kant was especially, you know, influenced by the Moravian, Moravian kind of pietism as well, too. So I see why he's going through there. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, is this a, a, a philosophical anthropology of the dialectic in in how we got up to Marx, or mm -hmm. do you think do you think there's is it in a sense a kind of arbitrary genealogy, or is there a or do you think I mean, he, I know he couldn't have done everything, um, but do you, do you see this this platonic line leading? The, is it the strongest for him in regards to the dialectic? Uh, is my yeah, I think I think it all. I've, I've thought about this question, and my my assumption would be, and I'm not sure because I've read several reviews of the book, um, and a lot of folks immediately turn their attention to the third part of the text, which is the contemporary, which is Kobolkovsky talking about the time of his of his own time and the thinkers of his time, his contemporaries. And that's the majority of where the text gets a lot of attention. I think it would behoove us to focus a lot more on this other part, because the other omission that is very interesting is that Kobolkovsky did his dissertation on Spinoza, but Spinoza does not appear in this genealogy, even in the section on the Enlightenment, which is crazy. Neither does Descartes. So there are a lot of omissions, but I think the main thrust of what he's trying to say is that there's the radicality of Neoplatonism and its um, confrontation with the problem of the contingency of human existence, right? Which oscillates and takes different forms over time and matures. Right. Because by the time of Hegel, it's fully socialized. It's a social problem. Whereas for Plotinus, it was absolutely uh, not even thought of in that way. Right. So I think that that's the main issue, because, again, I think I mentioned on the first space, uh, he sees no he sees a line of continuity in Marx's project from the early Marx all the way on to the mature Marx, which for most Marxists, they insist that there's actually a huge difference. There's a huge break there. And the reason is, is that it has to do with the discovery of the proletariat. And it has to do with Marx's break from the socialistic trends of his time. What in the Communist Manifesto Marx calls um, the true socialists, 
quote unquote true socialist, which he uses as a pejorative, right? Because for for Marx, the true socialists, the utopian socialists, were riddled with problems, and they that they had to be overcome. And Marx discovers a certain scientific orientation of revolution that Kovakovsky wants to identify. I think that's one point. And then I think the other point is that um, he, in the later part of the main currents book, you should, everyone should read his treatment of Lukács because it's the most, it's the most obvious that he sees Lukács as the most important philosopher of Marxism in the 20th century by far. A. B. He also sees Lukács as providing the best reading of Marx that he's ever encountered. So in a way, I like this book because it is a Lukacian orientation as well. And a lot of Lukács and Ernst Bloch's work, because they were very close comrades, at least in the early time, was obsessed with this question of what is the prehistory and the genealogy of Marxism. And this is one version that Kovokovsky is giving to us. As I mentioned before, there's other versions we could talk about. There's Bloch's theory about uh, Avicenna and Aristotelianism. There's Jacob Tobe's uh, theory of uh, basically the Joachim of Fiore, the prophetic, uh, who the Franciscans actually called a prophet, but he developed the eschatological theory of historical time broken down into three stages, right? Which Hegel would, is the true um, progenitor of Hegelianism in some sense. So you see my point, which is, and I think that's actually interesting for Marxists today, which is what, what is our account? Right? What is our genealogical account? And you could even say that thinkers like Foucault, even though Foucault has a very ambivalent relationship to Marxism, is also trying to do something kind of similar in a way, right? Which is, how do we understand contemporary social processes through kind of genealogical means, right? And I think Kovakovsky is doing that, but he's pinpointing the centrality of Marx's theory of alienation, of proletariat, and of Marx's humanism, first and foremost. And he also has a theory of Marx's epistemology, which I think is worth talking about. But let me stop there and see if I've answered your question well. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I think Elizabeth has a question and then I'll I have a I'll jump in after that, please. Yeah. So I think if I understand correctly, one of the reasons that this text is so important is because it helps us clarify maybe Marx's purpose or his intention or his sort of um, kind of vision. And I think it's really interesting to think about, um, you know, people today reading Marx for sort of inspiration or their own vision. Um, in the epilogue, um, it says Marxism has been the greatest fantasy of our century. It was a dream offering the prospect of a society of perfect unity in which all human aspirations would be fill, fulfilled and all values reconciled. And in sort, which, which is, I think, maybe a sort of a critique, but also kind of interesting to go back to those, you know, those beginnings and those foundations of ideas for Marx. He says later in the epilogue that Marx seems to have imagined that um, once capitalists were done away with, and I realize he's kind of, um, his, his rhetoric is maybe a little more um, critique, uh, a little more of a critique than I would like. But um, it says once capitalists were done away with, the whole world could be a kind of Athenian agora. Um, human beings would cease to be selfish and their interests would coincide in perfect harmony. So it seems like He's saying that the effectiveness of Marxism is an instrument of, he says this, um, political mobilization. And so I just wonder if you could further clarify, you say in your blog post that much of his work remains deeply important for Marxists to read. So if you could clarify maybe um, the difference between maybe Marxists and maybe neo-Marxists or post-Marxist mm. and sort of the role of, um, of sort of maybe practical personal inspiration that we might get and what um, Kowakowski might offer us in terms of that since 
since from what I read from at least the epilogue, he seems to point to that sort of inspiration that like fantasies and utopias can give us. Yeah. I think this is a very contradictory part of, of his, of his presentation in the, in the, in what sense, if you, if you read the end of the first section, he's very clear that Marxism was never intended as a utopian gesture. To the contrary, he says that Marxism put forward what he calls a Promethean based myth for the rehumanization of humanity. And he says that against the socialist utopians, Marxism was not concerned with the lot of the poor, but was rather concerned with dehumanization across all classes. And so a universal theory of alienation of capitalism. It just so happened that proletariat had a unique strategic advantage to the achievement of the abolition of capitalism. But Marx, and he has a beautiful point where there's a, um, a poor working class intellectual named William Waitling, who was a German intellectual at the time, is very utopian socialist, very Christian, and Marx once uh, met with him. And Waitling was like, um, basically talking about this kind of messianic vision of the poor, messianic vision of the underclass, and how revolution is going to be redemptive for them. And Kobokowski says uh, they have a record of Marx meeting this guy, and Marx, like, he said the meeting was a total disaster, because this is the opposite of what Marx wanted, you see. So I think that Kobokowski has a certain respect about Marxism before Marxists, if that makes sense, right? Because there's Marxism as a doctrine, which was against those that kind of vulgar theory. Because again, Hegel's reinterrogation of Neoplatonism in the absolute for Marx could not be reliant on a theory of the state. It was reliant on a theory of freedom. And that itself was anti-status, and that itself was something which was about, even though it was underthought by both Marx and Engels, was about the in, envisioning a society that was classless, but also around the maximization of flourishing of all individuals in a universal sense, right? And he even says very clearly that you can read Marx to the letter and you will find an anti-technocratic and anti-statist thinker. Again, why? Well, it's because he saw the deleterious effects of statist Hegelianism in his own time and he wanted to go against that, you see? So I think that um, when we see the end of his book and he's railing on Marxists, and he's trying to say that Marx has a, a genealogical through line to Stalin. I think we can go back and say, look, here's a great historian of ideas who actually sh shines a light on the history of Marxism and the prehistory. But he's also a uh, victim to the horrors of living under the Stalinist regime in Poland. And that clouded his vision, pure and simple. I think it clouded his vision. And I also think if you read a lot of commentators, they're like trying to be very liberal triumph triumphant because he kind of died as neoliberalism was taking off and he couldn't see the return of like class struggle <laughs> that we live with today, right? Like there's a reason why Marxism is, well, a lot of books are being published about Marx is because a lot of Marx's notions of capitalism are being, are, are returning in form, you see? Those contradictions are returning. Whereas... Kowalkowski is in the period of a Western triumphant welfare state during the Fordist period, right? And so he's trying to trying to make an argument against Marxism to court. But I don't think that holds anymore. So, uh, but where I would find inspiration is in the philosophical Marxism that he opens up for us. And all of the different avenues by which we can look at the genealogical prehistory of Marxism, which fascinate me. So I, that, that would be what I would say to that. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. I actually, in your answer, I, I got um, a kind of epiphany moment because I, I saw, I finally saw what the, the chronology was doing. Um, and I realized now why he has this Neoplatonic tradition. Yes. Uh, and it really hit home exactly what you said, this Promethean, it's a kind of Prometheanism um, yeah. And what do we what do we see um, what do we see in uh, Neoplatonic thought? But you know, um, at I, I mean, I, 
met her kind of a, as privation, but also contingency, as he says. Mm -hmm. But there's also this this line of um, as soon as Christianity happens, as soon as Augustine of Hippo, we get yeah. this. All of a sudden, there's this now fall. So it's no longer privation or contingency, but we have this falling away from the absolute. And how can we how can we better attest to ourselves, or how can we align ourselves back with the with the absolute as opposed to contemplation or the ascetic or any kind of ideal? So now I'm seeing the juxtaposition of why he's doing that, and I think that's actually brilliant. And that, and the other reason the other reason he's doing that, Chris, is he makes an argument that Marx and Engels have distinct epistemological concerns. And he reads Marx much more in this, let's call it quasi-theological vein of thinking liberation qua consciousness. Because for Kovakovsky, uh, Marx's theory of alienation and as well as ideology critique and his theory of commodity fetishism are the cornerstones of what's most robust in Marx's discoveries. Not so much the, la the labor theory of value or the mature work in capital, for which he sees no contradiction to the early stuff with that, you see? So that's another reason why the Neoplatonist restoration of the contingency of man's finite existence, etc., is more in line with Marx. Whereas for Engels, um, it, he really sees Engels, I think, in an uncharitable way as a kind of biological positivist, as kind of trying to um, work with these sort of dialectics of nature categories. And he really thinks Engels is onto something completely different than Marx. And that they have two distinct ways of theorizing the emancipation of the working class and proletariat. Um, and it's interesting also because he does uh, recognize that Engels was actually at some points in history, especially in the late 1900s, I'm sorry, late 1800s, his thought was probably even more influential on the workers' movement than was Marx, Right. So um, that's the other beautiful thing is that Marx's texts are all constantly being rediscovered. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think this is that's a helpful intervention that helps us see this very strange thing of talking about Marxism and Neoplatonism, which people don't normally couple. It's a very strange uh, couple to make, but I think it's starting to make a little more sense now. So the the distinction between um, utopian utopianism and fatalism. Um, also has me really thinking. Um, one of my favorite pieces of literature in, in German idealism is the the oldest systematic program of German idealism. And of course, it's written by Hutterlin and Hegel and Schelling. And when they come up with the idea of the state, the first thing they say is that the state can never exist in the first place because mm. the idea of the state, an idea is organic and the state is this mechanical um is this mechanical process that, you know, um, compartmentalizes and and um, um, you know is not a is not a freeing motion. It's not a it's not a free movement um, for their and so they need a new kind of mythos and a new religion and a new um, um, politics. Um, and then and then as well with Fichte and you wanted me to bring up Fichte and you wanted to talk about this. Um, in Fichte's vocation of a scholar, the same thing happens. He kind of has this kind of pre-anarchistic state, the state that yeah. is, that's a kind of melding of everyone's will, like the will of the people almost, I mean, it's a little different. I would say it's close to Blanqui, but not really. Um, so is, is this kind of anarchistic utopianism dangerous to him, or does he see... Because I was try I was getting confused a little bit with this idea. Because I actually like I really like this idea that the state itself is this me mechanical uh, process, and yet the our ideas behind what a state is unifying a people or unifying everyone in in the will of of some end good or end goal. I like that idea, but he seems to think that this will semi these utopian theories and these fatalist theories end up in the the wrong way, end up in a kind of a procedure up to Stalin. Am I completely wrong or am I semi all right? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's, com it's complex in a way because you have to go back to various polemics that Marx has with different figures, such as the polemics that he has after the Paris Commune with Proudhon, um, who was really the kind of um, lightning rod and leader in many ways of the Paris Commune. And of course, the Paris Commune was an event which um, was the first time in which the European working class actually possessed what's, what Marx called dictatorship of proletariat. Right, which was a basic seizure of state power for a limited time, which was taken away. But that event um, opened up a certain knowledge of revolutionary strategy, right? And that Marx would enter into a series of polemics with anarchists subsequently and would himself formulate um, a different relationship of how uh, communism is to relate to the state. Of course, Kowalkowski also makes an interesting point, which is that this controversial claim, but he says both Marx and Engels in their later work, put forward the thesis, which he accuses Marxists of uh, ignoring, which is that they both submitted that a revolution of capitalism could occur through non, nonviolent or re non-revolutionary means, right? Which is interesting because Karl Kotsky, who was a sort of contemporary of Marx, um, put forward a, a similar approach in Germany, which was basically what he tried to do, right? Which was kind of through the workers' movement, which was not necessarily uh, the same kind of revolutionary energy that you saw in the Paris Commune, right? And the other thing that Kovakovsky says is that Leninism and Bolshevism, and I'm not sure if I agree with him here at all, actually, should be thought of as completely distinct from Marx's theory of revolution. Why? Because he's always big on trying to point out that if you have a change in capitalism, say like um, a major technology like an airplane or an automobile is invented, that, that those ripple effects change the composition of the possibility of changing, overcoming capitalism. So he's, he's he, and that's a frustrating thing about Kovakovsky, which I think is a limitation of his own approach. Because of his bias against Marxism, he's not able to put forward a more charitable reading of the relationship between Bolshevism and Maoism, for example, right? He can't make these kinds of connections because he's interested in an adversarial polemic, right? So there are limitations of Kovalkovsky's stuff, I think, later. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the question of Marxism in the state is a big one. And a lot of Marxists today have, um, you know, all sorts of debates regarding this question. And one of the things on my podcast that we've tried to interrogate is what is the meaning of the Marxist theory of dictatorship of proletariat? I mean, in a very famous letter that Marx wrote to a Civil War general, Weidemeyer, he says, my most important idea was basically that the only means of revolutionizing capitalism um, is through what he names dictatorship of proletariat. But then, of course, you say dictatorship of proletariat, and it has all the baggage of Stalinism associated with it, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a question both, I think, of rhetoric, but also of revolutionary strategy, and even, I would say, of whether today we're still committed to the category of revolution as such, and which is something I personally think that we should be, but it requires a lot of conversations, I think. One of the interesting things is that Kovakovsky wrote a text when he was a communist in his early period that everyone should read, I can post it on Twitter if anyone's interested, called the idea of the left. And he basically says that in the, in the necessary kind of polemics that the Marxist left have with themselves, it's extremely important to center the centrality of ideas in your political dissensions and debates in short. And he was making this intervention for the Polish uh, left at the time, and it proved to be quite an interesting thing. It's worth actually examining this proposition, I think, in some sense. Um, but now I'm kind of drifting, Chris, but um, you, you raised a huge question, which I don't know if I can adequately answer on Marxism in a state. Um, no, 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 I'm, I apologize for that. But one one area of the text that um, he he definitely had me, and I definitely agree with him, um, is with Hegel and this idea, and especially in the phenomenology of spirit. So after yeah. the this, after the section on the unhappy consciousness, 
Um, yeah. It's literally that the people need a mythos to, to link them together. And this, this, of course, is Christianity, and they need to have some kind of changeable entity in order for pure mediation. And then, of course, what is Christianity other than, you know, it, you know how do we... How do we turn Christianity into an, into the immediacy for the state, for the people? And then he brings up the whole moral law and the, the divine law. And yes, and so I think this idea, his idea, of, I think Hegel's motion of the state here, very yeah. early on in the phenomenology, phenomenology of, of spirit, is quite troubling. And um, and he, he doesn't say this so much in words, but in a sense, it's kind of like the subordination of the ideal over the real. So we get mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. abstract conception that's supposed to link the totality of, of the people um, in, 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 in replace of, in, like, you know, for some abstract notion of freedom. The same thing happens in the science of logic as well, too, with the, ab- with the absolute concept. Or... So, yes, so there, there were a, a lot of, I think, very interesting points, especially his critique of 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 Hegel and um yeah. and I saw this almost in line because you know he makes his writing and you said he was very close with Lukash and I, I saw some some connections between Lukash's critique of irrationalism with you know Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Nietzsche, Schelling, etc. So I saw right. some some kind of overlaps with that when he was really critiquing um Hegel and I think his critiques of Hegel and the state are are concerning. I think they're. I think he's sort of right on that. I'm not. I don't lean so close to Hegel, but I think he he does a really good reading of that. Um, yes, I totally agree because I think he shows how there was a lot of work that the young Hegelians had done before Marx was even familiar with them. Like when Marx was a law student, and what part of what they did was they set the ground for someone to come along like Marx to push the radicalism, which was inherent in the young Hegelian movement to let's say the next level, you know what I mean? And so I think he does a beautiful job of breaking down the theses on Feuerbach by Marx and Engels as perhaps the most significant intervention of Marx's philosophy, right? Which really establishes what Kowalkowski calls like a new political epistemology, right? And um, it it has to do with this famous turning Hegel on his head, but it's basically um, finding in history itself the conditions that can make it rational, conditions in which empirical development can coincide with the consciousness of the people and do away with false consciousness. Because he also spends a lot of time understanding what Marx means by false consciousness and that he says that false consciousness for Marx does not should not be understood as referring to like consciousness of the true or the false but is actually thought in relationship to man's practical activity as bound up in social relations so it's a different form of uh, knowledge tied to what Marx calls praxis right and that theory of knowledge of praxis is exactly where Lukács in his famous book, History and Class Consciousness, will also identify the core of Marx's philosophy. So I think that's a really helpful thing because I think a lot of folks that study Marxism today maybe are less familiar with that reading of, of, of the young Marx. And um, I still insist that it's actually like a super important point to to recognize, and I, I would also say that I agree that it remains of paramount significance. Like, there's nothing, and I'd love to even open on the floor to see what others think, because I know on this call we have a lot of really great Marxologists and people that study Marx a lot, um, and they're probably, like, dying to intervene here. But I would just say, like, I think it's really worth reading uh, this first section of this book. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Let's go ahead and open up. Um, so if you have a question or you have something you want to share, um, then go ahead and request a mic and we will let you speak. 
the first speakers are always usually a little shy at first, but once we get the first person speaking, then then the floodgates open. So yeah, I can start calling on people too. No, the people that I know. <laughs> no. Yeah, do it. You have the power. Yeah. I mean, we we've we've only covered like I don't know three thousand years of human history in this in this hour long uh, spaces. So you know, it's a very ambitious space we got going here. Um. But yeah, no, it's it's extremely. I mean, Elizabeth, you're totally right. Like, he needs to be read with so many caveats and provisos. And, you know, I think it's interesting that the right wing today doesn't invoke him as a weapon. It shows the paucity of the right today, which is that, like, the right wing intellectuals, he's way too sophisticated for them, whereas they used to use him all the time. So we actually do have a question. Um, right, cool. um, we're going to go to Mr. Fahrenheit. So, Mr. Fahrenheit, you can unmute yourself and, and speak directly to um, Dr. Tut. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I wasn't here for the beginning, but um, my question is, do you see Marx as continuing something started by Plato, or, or do you see it as something radically different? Yeah, I was trying to say that uh, Kowalkowski gives us the tools to understand that um, we can't really say that Marx is a Platonist, but rather that what Neoplatonism, in particular, and Plato to some extent as well, opens up that Marx is also concerned with at the heart of his philosophy is the liberation of humanity through union with the absolute, right? So as a kind of philosopher working in the shadow or the wake of Hegelianism, for which that question of how to resolve man's relationship to the absolute, because there's also an important point that um, John Scotus Erigina makes, uh, which is this basic, this notion of a partial absolute or a kind of, um, he's the first philosopher, first Neoplatonist philosopher to put forward what he calls a mirror of the absolute, right? And so there's like, like what he's opening in this text in the first 60 pages is basically a mini historical genealogy of the absolute, right? And Marxism constitutes, uh, I think, in Kowalkowski's sense, a solution to Hegel's theory of the absolute, which is more superior, which is more robust, more rigorous regarding the end goal, which would be the emancipation of humanity from its shackles of alienated labor for Marx, right? There's other theories of alienation for Aquinas, for Augustine, this is to be understood through, you know, eternal damnation, various Christian theories of transcendence, right? Evil, the question of evil, the question of theodicy. What is, does Marxism concern itself with theodicy? It's a very interesting question, I think, which for which I think Kowalkowski would basically say yes. But it handles theodicy in a way which does not um, fetishize the damned of the earth or the proletariat. Because he does a whole beautiful point. Because what is theodicy? You guys probably know this concept. Is what is the uh, philosophical or, or, or theological answer of human suffering? And Marx is very clear that as revolutionaries, you should never fetishize the suffering of the working class. This is the error of socialists and utopian socialists. They get caught in Christianity, right? So again, Marx is creating a kind of um, what Kowalkowski calls a rehumanization, a rehumanization that's reliant on the development of the productive forces. So he's reading him definitely as a productivist and as a Promethean, which is that he's trying to harness the powers of technology to overcome capitalism. But he's also at times, and I think Kowalkowski does a nice job at times, he's really reading Marx as very like producerist. And at other times he's reading Marx as more um, vague about what revolution might entail. And it is this kind of open, almost quasi-anarchist proposition. So there's a bit of ambivalence there, perhaps. I hope that answers your question. 
Uh, yes, um, that, 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 that helps. Um, so uh, the absolute for Marx would be um, like the communist end goal. Yeah, I mean, the absolute for Marx would be, according to Sobolkowski, a... He, he oscillates, but in some sense, he wants to say that it is a utopianism, that there is a utopianism in Marx, absolutely, for which Neoplatonism opens up the possibility of this utopianism. So in that sense, it would be the fully achieved communist society, in some sense, for which you're taking, you know, Hegel's famous idea of the sphere of ethical life, but you're not making it reliant on a model of the Prussian state, right? Um, so there's that possibility for which he gives vague hints and indications of what that state might look like, referring to some ethical maxims um, to each according to his ability, to each according to his needs, for example, but not much more than that in part because Marx is ardently anti-statist for most of his, for most of his career. So I think, I think, yes, the answer to that would be, would be that it would be the achievement of a communist revolution, right? It would, it would, it's, it's always a revolutionary wager in Marx's estimation. So yeah, I, think, a, I think that would be oh, right. Yeah, there's a movement away from the, the fall of humanity and sin to being entangled with contingency or right he he likes this idea this promethean kind of that he gets from the neoplatonic tradition it's it's making much more sense now exactly yeah yeah and there are vague notions that Bukowski will say is responsible for the catastrophe of stalinism precisely because marx's reflections on what the future communist society will look like were not com not detailed enough in some sense so he wants to say yes marx is the anti-utopian obviously he wrote all of these texts against the utopian socialists that's obvious but then so why did marxism in practice say in the ussr become so against marx's core theory well maybe one reason is because marx didn't detail it right so, so there's all of those points, too, which if you read the text, especially the second part of the text called The Golden Age, I would recommend that. And again, I just want to say for folks that are interested in all this, this book is very readable and I think it's worth looking at. Um, I definitely as a, I definitely did not read it and walk away thinking like, oh, gosh, Marxism is the worst. If anything, I think it strengthened my commitments and resolve to the Marxist tradition. And I think it's important to read texts like that, to be honest. Yeah, there's all there's all there's it's a it's a great uh, practice to know thy enemy, right? To read read texts that challenge us, and and you learn more about it, and you learn more. It strengthens your position in a sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, well, you have to first you have to first understand like who constitutes an enemy. <laughs> I'm learning this in writing my book on Nietzsche right now, Chris, because. Uh, is Nietzsche an enemy or is he not? It depends on who you ask. <laughs> you know, right. it's it's funny. I'm I'm no, I'm no longer a Deleuzian, but when I liked Deleuze at the time, um, he said something that I think stuck with me. He said, "Philosophical enemies. Um, it, to be a philosophical enemy means you have to have the most rigorous respect for them. You have to know." all of their ticks and all of the, mm. you know, the wheels of the machine, you have to read them through in order. So in a sense, a philosophical enemy is the highest respect that you can give to someone, which I find hilarious, but also oh, there's a, there's a kernel of truth to that statement, actually. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I have another question. Sure. Uh, what do people have against utopianism or, or what does Marx have against utopianism? Marx is opposed to socialist utopianism in a certain variety, but there's been many Marxists who argue that Marx does retain a commitment to utopianism, but with qualifications, right? So utopianism um, is a problem in, say, the Prodoon variation. If you read a, a text that uh, Marx wrote against Prodoon after Paris Coming called The Poverty of Philosophy, it basically says the problem with utopianism revolves around um, 
the fact that it's not able to rupture the capitalist mode of production in an adequate enough way. It actually reproduces and doesn't challenge the hegemony of the capitalist mode of production adequately enough because it relies on kind of small scale um, commune living and so on and so forth. So while Marx is interested in the commune form and he's interested in the writings of utopian socialists and he learns from them, there's an interesting um, essay actually about many of the utopian American um, religious movements that Marx and Engels studied very closely, right? So in some of them, it's very mixed. It's a very, very, very uh, rich literature on Marx and utopianism. I would highly recommend um, Ernst Bloch, um, the, the German Marxist philosopher of the 20th century, um, who's written extensively on, on Marxist. So there is a tradition of Marxist utopia, but there is also a false way of doing utopia, which revolves again from a historical materialist standpoint around whether your theory of revolution is adequately transcending capitalism or not. Because there's a lot of utopianism that can kind of fall into a kind of counterculture version of communal living, which reify, sort of maintains capitalist domination. So you have to um, get square with your theory of revolution and utopianism, I think would be the caveat that Marx would want to make. I hope that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think Ernest Bloch's um, Spirit of Utopia. Yes. I really love I love that text. That's a brilliant text. Yeah, he, he's he's a great writer too. He's a bit like Frederick Jameson. Some some of you may be familiar with Jameson. He um he really pulls a lot from popular culture. And um he's always talking about film and television of his own time. I mean, he's writing in like the thirties and the twenties, but it's extremely interest he's talking he's he's very humanist right so he's talking about all domains of human knowledge and um and he sees in capitalism what he calls unfinished elements of utopian vision of humanity that are kind of incomplete right and he, he provides a kind of mode of analyzing society as kind of incomplete forms of failed utopias right um so he's he's a, f a figure who gives dignity back to the concept of utopia, um, but there's a lot of socialist utopians that are to be rejected according to Marx, um, because they 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 provide like um, you know, and I think I think that there's 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 a lot of like practical ways to understand the pitfalls of utopianism, even like if you take something like Burning Man or even like post 60s counterculture movements, I would almost characterize that as a bit like, because they can call themselves revolutionary, right? But are they actually changing like the true like, condition of the class structure of capitalism, right? Like the people that are actually the proletarian class? They're probably not, right? So I think Marx does have a point about this. Um, it's almost like utopia for Marx is founded in a revolutionary gesture would be one way to, I think, square the point. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, if, there are any other, if there are any other questions, um, all you have to do is request a mic. And I, I just have to ask you, Daniel, how are you doing for time? Because it is past nine o'clock. And I know we did have that little, that uh, blip in, in the internet. But are you all right for one more yeah. question? Yeah, we yeah. can do one more question. That sounds great. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to go to Highland Hospital. All right. Yeah, just an alias. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, bringing this guy to my attention. It's pretty interesting stuff. Um, is it would it be crude to say he tried to pull like uh, like the Francis Fukuyama like move early, or just he wanted to write the uh, obituary? for um marxism and like his time and just try to like get his peers or students or whatever to begin to move on from it or maybe mm -hmm. i missed that part mm -hmm. or something i don't know yeah yeah that's right then like richard Rorty, the famous american philosopher said that the main currents of marxism book ended 
traditional Marxism in the academy and that in the academy, American academics, he says, and Sidney Hook, who used to be the most famous American Marxist uh, turned pragmatist liberal, there's a whole pipeline of interesting figures. This is one thing in 20th century is that like when you're in 20th century intellectual and you're involved in these things, you know, they had serious intellectual conversions, right? But it wasn't arbitrary or lightweight. Like, so you could be, if you were a Marxist, you were a Marxist because somewhere in the world, people were revolutionary, uh, revolutionizing their society under the principles of Marxism, right? Post-60s, post-1960s, he says, uh, Sidney Hook says this in his review of main currents of Marxism, he says, like, the stakes of Marxism have changed because Marxist ideas are not at the vanguard of actual revolutionary activity. Now, of course, with me saying that, that's not fair and that's not exactly true in our time because my argument would be actually in a post-2008 economic crisis after economic crisis situation we find ourselves in, Marxist ideas have returned. Marxist ideas have returned. Um, there's so many indications of that. What I think is missing is the fact that um, are the social movements that are contesting the status quo informed by Marxist practice? That's what's missing, I think, in some sense. I mean, to some extent, you could say they are. But that brings up the whole debate that Elizabeth hinted at, which I didn't answer, which is what is post-Marxism? Is post-Marxism to be understood merely as um, what's left of Marxism after it's no longer in its revolutionary phase, right? Or is post-Marxism the position like David Harvey, who was one of the great expositors of Marxist capital? You probably heard of him. His YouTube videos on Marxist capital are seen by millions of people. And his latest position is that capitalism is too big to revolutionize. So for me and for Kowalkowski, the heart of Marxism is revolutionary socialism. That's the heart of Marxism. That's why he starts with the Neoplatonist origin and goes all the way up through Hegel up to Marx, because it's about the restoration of emancipation of humanity as such. And Marx is trying to give the most comprehensive solution to that, right? And philosophy is the, um, the head. The proletariat's the heart. Philosophy is the head of the revolution, right? But the revolution, in an interesting way, actually, he says, um, turns all philosophy on its, on its head as well and actually revolutionizes philosophy as such, or like what comes after the socialist revolution philosophy will not look the same, according to Marx, um, in on the Jewish question. Um, so, I, I'm sorry, in, uh, in the German ideology, I think he says that. So I guess the answer to your question is yes, that's what he's trying to do. But I don't think he succeeds, because the historical conditions that we live in make the relevance of Marxism return in my opinion. I think that's great. I think that's a really inspirational place to end. Um, I just want to thank our audience so much for um, coming in and listening. This is such an amazing opportunity. Um, I just was, I just have benefited from this, you know, all week in preparation. And now with this amazing opportunity to hear um, Dr. Daniel Tut speak. So thank you so much. Um, Daniel, is there anything else you want to say um, as closing any sort of advice if people want to, you know, sort of continue thinking about this aside from, you know, getting main currents and reading it? Um, yeah. yeah, any any place to even start in the work of Marx? Sure. Well, I think in the spirit of Kobokowski's reading, I would suggest that folks familiarize themselves with the first section of the book. And also consider some of these other, if you're interested, look into Lucien Goldman's work on the prehistory of the bourgeoisie in his wonderful book called The Hidden God, incredible work, which was hugely influential to Kowalkowski. But also recommend a great work on the history of, which is similar to Bain Currents, history of the workers' movement, but also a history of the rise of fascism which has recently been re-released by Verso Books called The Destruction of Reason by Lukács, Georg Lukács, who is a kind of close uh, thinker to, to Kovakovsky in many ways. I recommend that work. Um, and then I'd recommend, you know, folks consider 
um, some of these texts we've mentioned from Marx, the thesis on Feuerbach, the German ideology, um, the, the, the philosophical manuscripts of 1844 would be interesting, the ones on alienation in particular. So going back and reading some of those early Marxist texts might be, might be of interest to folks as well. And of course, reading Capital is essential. Of course, that's absolutely essential. But I think it's worth understanding Kolokovsky's argument as to why the early Marxist positions remain congruent throughout. Because he does have a section on Marx's capital where he describes the distinction between um, use value and exchange value, labor theory of value, what the value form is, um, Marx's theory of exploitation. Like all of that stuff is well documented. But again, the heart of Marxist theory is this revolutionary gesture. And I think the interesting thing is that, yeah, that revolutionary gesture could very well reemerge in our life, right? Like if Marxism is the kind of eternal science of the revolution of capitalism, which I think it is, that means that it's a kind of ever-present doctrine. You know what I mean? It's, it's always going to be with us um, and is always going to remain evergreen and always going to remain pertinent until we figured out how to adequately overcome the contradictions of our world, right? How, until we figure out how to overcome capitalism, right? Because Marx is the thinker who most succinctly and most robustly names that act and gives us the kind of the best account of it. So that's my, I'm going to end on a positive uh propaganda point for Marxism, because we're, we've talked about a thinker who is very opposed to Marxism. <laughs> so I want to, I just wanted to thank um, Dr. Daniel Tutt for coming into our space, Philosophy in the Spotlight. I have posted um, his personal blog on, on this, on this text, so you can read um, Daniel's uh, interpretation via the blog. I'll also post um, a link to his podcast so if anyone's interested in listening to his podcast um i'll also post that link so you can listen more to what daniel has to say part of our show is not only just talking about a philosopher but we also like to highlight um the scholar that we've brought on and we'd like to um, highlight daniel's work as well too so thank you so much daniel for for being here <laughs> uh, it, you were absolutely brilliant and you presented such a a very kind and robust theory of this text that you know that we've been reading through the week and it's so nice to have you here and yes thank you for being here and um yeah thank you for joining our community we call this a community we've been bringing in people from all over to have these discussions and now you're a part of the community and we're so happy about that that's great i've had a great time i hope everyone enjoyed this uh, summary of the book and some points and just reach out with any further questions and um and i'd, I'd be happy to chat on twitter i spend too much time on twitter but hopefully it's all for the best because i also chris and elizabeth try to build community on twitter as well uh, and elsewhere but you know we have to make the best of the platform for all of its negatives i think we can we can also identify a lot of positives as well yeah, there's so much negativity on it that we, we need to really do this. <laughs> you and absolutely. I have had discussions about this before. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, so once again, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, this is, we're going to call it a, um, call it quits. And thank you so much. Um, we will be posting this recording on our YouTube channel to archive it. And it'll also be on my feed if you'd like to listen through again. And so thank you for everyone for all of the questions for all of the, the fast DMs that I've received about how wonderful the talk has been. It's great. And um, have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.